now. Hey, we got a special guest here. I, honestly, I don't think I've ever seen her not smile. And I think that's right, right, Shannon? I think you're right. I, I hope so. That is so true, so true. I have known this girl for more than half of her life, and I'm going to let her introduce herself and a little bit about what she's doing right now, but we're going to talk about softball. We're going to talk about the Olympics. We're going to talk about professional playing. We're going to talk a little bit about she's played all over the world in softball, and now she's on, on, on route to... Um, to the Olympic side and in, in winter games. So Shannon, introduce yourself. <laughs> Thanks, Kurt. Um, my name is Shannon Gallia. I am a high school phys ed teacher, but I currently work for the Canadian Olympic Committee on a program called Game Plan, which teaches athletes to find balance on and off the field of play. And um, yeah, I was a former softball athlete, competed in the international circuit around the world. And um, transition to winter sport after retiring from softball, which was, you know, quite interesting uh, in, in the sense that there's a lot of storytelling there. And um, while I was traveling for softball, I competed my master's in Olympic studies in policy, which was done at the German Sport University in Cologne. And that's what kind of kept my world tour going was education, research and learning about athletes and, and athlete wellness. So anyhow, uh, a little bit about this. Um, everyone knows, that, no one knows actually, I think in Canada they do know, but this girl that you're looking at right now is probably one of the top athletes that's ever come out of Canada. And we're talking about athletes. Uh, there's a girl that played softball at a high level. I think you mentioned you were in 20 championships, national championships. Yeah, I competed in 20 national ch Canadian championships. And uh, yeah, started that circuit probably when I was in high school, and if not earlier, my first Canadian championship was when I was 12 years old. And um, and you medaled in half of them. Yes, more than, I medaled in about actually nine, nine of them. So close to half of them. Close, That's close to half. Good. So then you went on, uh, Beijing happened, and then you went on and you said, I'm gonna be an athlete somewhere, and you landed in the Netherlands. So tell us about that. I wanna know about the Dutch athletes as well. Yeah, sure. So Beijing softball was the last time that, that, that Beijing was the last time softball was in and it, in the Olympic program. And a lot of athletes at my time in that in that era, we came to a crossroads in, in terms of what our goals were in the sport. You know, it was you finish college ball and then you maybe consider playing in the pro circuit down in the States and you can or you continue to play for Team Canada and do the, the World Cups and the World Championships. Um, and then some people just decided to retire and quit and that was the end of their career. But for me, I just was always kind of holding on to the dream. I just always felt that our sport, you know, just was such an international sport. There was so much to it. I, I loved it. I loved watching it in the Olympics and I just felt like it was too premature to be pulled from the Olympic program. And so, I, you know, I got to a point in my development where when Team Canada was no longer in my, you know, in my path and I wasn't something that they wanted to consider, I still wanted to show Softball Canada, my sport, my NSO, um, you know, what other possibilities were available to athletes. Um, so just because I didn't make Team Canada, there's 15 spots, yet there were so many athletes who played the sport across the country you know, what else do I have to offer to give back to this game? And I had learned from a few athletes who had played overseas in the circuit, uh, in the European Cup circuit, um, in Australia, New Zealand, but it was, you know, very hush hush. It wasn't really well known. And I thought, I, I'm going to do this. I, I definitely want to play abroad. I've played in Canada, you know, for so many years. I got kind of not bored, but I just felt like we were going to nationals every year. That was the big tournament to look forward to. And, you know, the outcomes were always relatively sa the same. Um, and so I wanted a new challenge. And it was something that, again, Softball Canada didn't really promote. So I had to do a lot of my own research. And that's when I just got connected to you, not only you, who I was already connected to from when I was in high school through recruiting tournaments, um, I got connected through um, other recruiters in Europe who were willing to take my resume and play playing resume and see if there was a good fit for me overseas. What was cool about that whole story was um, I was able to 
obtained my second citizenship in Europe, which made it much easier for me to play overseas. Um, there was a ruling in the European Federation um, that they allowed European citizens to play for whatever team they wanted to. And there was a lot of really cool exchanges once you were in the European club circuit you know, you could play in Holland one weekend and then you could play for a Czech team on another weekend because there was a, it was quite open in terms of the rules. Um, and so when I found the team that I was looking for, so I played for the Griffins in Holland, which was in a city called Sertogenbosch or Den Bosch. And my coach Wout Isbouts at the time um, yeah. brought Good me over. Time. Yeah, he's he's essentially like a dad to me um he's if he ever sees this he's going to be probably chuckling right now to think about all the stories that i we'll, and, tag him, we'll tag him and the chaos that i put him through over those years and um so what was great about it was because i was going over on a maltese passport he was still able to recruit he, he still had two spots for americans to come over as imports um, so I was, I felt like a, like a, a secret or double agent, as you can say, cause I, I had my Canadian passport, but I also was relying on my Maltese passport, which opened up, um, Wout to recruit more athletes to come play for our team. And that's where I be, became close friends with two Americans. Um, one was from Florida, Emily Wimpkin and Emma Maas, who was from California. And so I felt like I had gotten this, you know, <laughs> I didn't go to the States. I didn't go to the States to play college ball because I chose the Canadian education and the Canadian softball circuit. Um, and I felt like I got my, you know, my college experience through those girls who came over and were fresh off, off the, the college circuit in the States. And, and, you know, we were coming over and exchanging our North American softball values with these Dutch athletes. And it's quite an experience because your first season, you know, some people just do one season and then they're done. They got their fix and they're ready to go home. And I remember after my first season, I thought I have so much to learn as an athlete. Um, I had to learn, you know, language and how, how, you know, the game was played in Holland. I mean, it's, I always use the, the tagline, same, same, but different, you know, you're playing the same game, but there are a lot of things that are different in the sense that, you know, the rules are the same, but the feel, the, the connection, the culture of the sport, uh, it's so different from what you're, you've grown up in, you know, all your life and all that you've known. Um, and that's what got me into wanting to learn more about what is the culture of softball in all these different countries, you know, how far and how much longer can I continue playing um, and explore. And part of my motivation was, you know, we were out of Beijing. I wasn't going to be playing for Team Canada. I had gotten over that dream, but I still went back and did the ID camps and still loved giving back to the community and working in the coaching um, realm of things with the Team Canada athletes who were representing Canada. We would come back and we'd run pitching clinics and catching clinics and fielding clinics. I would run all sorts of camps um, and I would bring back my international flavor from, you know, what I had experienced abroad. And I thought, one, this is a really cool way to, you know, be a voice in the softball community as to this is a great game, we need to keep this going. And how can I elevate that, that reason more so um, since Beijing? And two, you know, how, how, how important it is to bring back all those cultural perspectives from this from the various countries I lived in and what softball was like in those countries and bring it back to Canada and it helped me grow as a coach it helped me grow as a teacher as a high school phys ed educator um, it helped me grow you know even as a person as a human being because there's just so much to softball that was so important to me as an athlete but also as a person and I and that's something that I was able to bring back to the athletes in my own country. But what did and, you think of those Dutch athletes if I can interrupt really quick what did you think of the Dutch athletes did they play the game well did they play the game did they yeah. need to help? Um, what was so awesome was because it was in a year of um, it was 2012 so this was the first so it was my first year in Holland and it was also a games year. So we were, we were not in the London 2012 Olympics. And I got to really get to know all those athletes that kind of stuck around in Holland for 
the London 2012 games or what was expected to be softball because there were still talks about softball being put back in for Rio. So there were still a lot of these veteran players from, from the Olympics and, and from the national teams that I got to really get to know in Holland. Um, some became coaches, some were still playing. And that's where I was like, you know, I was so drawn to those athletes because I got to learn from them. They had been in the game for so long and they were great athletes. And at the time, um, there was myself and another Canadian, Ashley Lands, who played on Team Canada. Um, she was a great mentor for me being, you know, the only other Canadian over there learning a lot all at once. My first season, I struggled um, for sure. Like I had a lot to learn um, as an athlete and, and, you know, had to change my perspective on, you know, I'm no longer in Canada. I'm no longer playing the Canadian way. It was, I had to come over and adapt to how the, how the Dutchies play. And um, the one thing that, you know, Ashley really taught me is, you know, she had, she had, a, she was a seasoned player, a great athlete. She had the college experience. She had team Canada experience. So she had a lot of maturity um, to the game and she, she was a great, you know, mentor for me. Um, and we were over there and it was the year that Canada was hosting the world championships in Yukon Whitehorse. No, sorry. Yukon, <laughs> Yukon. Right. And, and um, they, the Dutch beat team Canada. And I thought, Whoa, this is, you know, obviously we're sad because they beat the Canadians, but you know, it's a friendly sport. And so Ashley and I were thinking, we're, athlete, right? Woo, we're in Holland. We're playing at the best league in, in Europe. Like this makes sense for why we're here and how we're growing the game. So it just really spoke volumes to one, the Olympic program eliminated a great sport far too early and prematurely um and two this game has so much potential to grow like there is some really phenomenal athletes in the sport and um so my first year was quite eye-opening in terms of you know learning that transition to playing overseas you know I was transitioning from leaving college athletics to playing um playing in the overseas loop so it was a little bit of a you know learning curve in terms of you know you're not practicing every day like you used to in, in uh, your yeah. college circuit. Um, what I loved about the Dutch, the way the Dutch way was you really learn that Europeans develop in their sport far later than the way North Americans do. You know, the North American, you know, Canadian, Canadians and, and Americans, you know, we specialize much earlier in our sports. Yeah. And I think it's great in some ways, but I'm actually heavily against it because look at how many athletes leave the sport too early yeah. because they're fed up of it and they're burnt out. Um, they don't, you know, they feel like they've reached the best of the best by the end of their college careers. And, and I had these conversations quite frequently with my two American teammates. Cause I thought we're only 22 years old, 23. We're, we're, not, we're we've reached one level of our prime but our whole twenties is a whole other, you know, prime to reach. There's so much peak performance to still be achieved. And that's so great. that's what I love. 28 is the peak they say. Is the, is the peak for females. I would even say a little bit later in, in some respect and depending on your sport, especially yeah. for pitchers. I mean, I can still throw, I, you know, I'm not training like I used to every day. I've, I've had to, you know, change over to other things as we'll get into later. And um, I look at the Americans, you know, a lot of those girls never wanted to play the game after their four years. And I thought, what? This is insane. There, there's so much to like learn about this game. There's, and so I, maybe because I didn't play in the NCAA and I chose and opted out to play in the NCAA for, for various reasons. And that was one of them. I, I wanted to love the game, but I also wanted to be a multi-sport athlete. And to do that in the NCAA is very, very difficult. Um, you can be a duo sport athlete, but I, I was such a big multi-sport athlete all through high school, F softball being the foundation and the absolute focus. But I still made sure that I was, you know, even though I had training almost every day throughout high school in softball, I was still making sure I was doing the basketball, the volleyball, the badminton, the bowling, javelin, tennis cross country 
basketball. Like I did eight sports and I made sure that my school sports were a priority because that was my outlet. And it was my outlet in the sense that I wasn't going to burn myself out from what my real focus was and my true passion, which was softball. And, and it helped you've me. Got a new, you've got a new passion now. Yes. Yeah. So then I'm going to do a little yeah. bit of intro here. Here's I, I know this girl from age like 13, 14, and she plays softball, 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 and a high, high, high level. I mean, the highest in, in, in Canada. And then all of a sudden I get news. News comes south. And it came south so hard. <laughs> Shannon is now going to be doing the skeleton in next year's, in the winter next year's Olympics for a country that she's a citizen of, which is pretty cool. Tell us a little bit about that, what you're doing right now, not right now, what you've done the last couple of months, that would kind of, I know it's sure. ended, but what you've done the last couple of months in getting better at this skeleton. Definitely, well, it's funny, you know, I played overseas in softball for so many years. And in those years, I was sort of dabbling in the identification camps for bobsleigh and skeleton here in Canada. And I thought, you know, softball is coming to an end. I was slowly coming to the end of my career. Um, I was finishing up my research and I thought, I still got a little bit in me. Like, what is it that I could, what's a sport that I could transition into and like, you know, excel at and test myself. And it was always coming down to bobsleigh and skeleton. Fast forward to this year um, and, you know, the last few years, i First, I thought, okay, if I want to try this sport, I better put my money where my mouth is and actually go to a camp um, or a training camp and see if I can physically see myself get on a sled and slide down a, a track full of ice at 100, you know, 100 plus kilometers per hour. And so I went to a learn to skeleton camp, which is what everyone starts off with. And it's, you know, your first taste of the sport. And I tried it and I thought, I can do this. Like I'm a pitcher. I know how to find my Zen. I, I know how to train. I was already, you know, the transition was easy because I had all those skills and those fundamentals put in place from softball and all my other sport experience that could be easily moved into this new sport. So while I was playing softball overseas as a Maltese athlete, so, um, although I was Canadian, I was using my Maltese passport to compete in all the different circuits abroad. Um, so I played in six different international federations, um, Australia, New Zealand, uh, Belgium, Italy, Holland, London, England, uh, Malta, because uh, and I'll get into that story as well, and then Italy. When I played for Italy, it was a joint agreement between the Maltese and the Italian Federation. And that's where I started to really get involved in sport for development. And I wanted to learn what it was like to start a sport from scratch and build it in a community. And so I, I had connected with sport leaders in Malta because I thought I wanna really know where I'm from. You know, I grew up not knowing what my country was like or what my second nation was like other than through my grandparents and my dad and, and all my aunts and uncles. So I only got a little piece of the culture at home here in Canada, but I always like, I'm a, I gotta see it to believe it kind of person. And so when I started working and competing in softball abroad, I wanted to start running camps in Malta. And I got to learn a lot about the sport culture there and learn that like female sport is quite small. It's, you know, there's a lot of inequalities when it comes to access to sport. Um, the nation at the time was almost known to be, um, they had high obesity rates. So physical education wasn't a priority um, in their education system. And so I was learning so much as not only as a teacher, but as an athlete, but also as a, a sport developer. And so I brought in NCAA coaches. I connected them with this father who literally brought softball to life on the island. And um, we were able to fly in athletes to come run camps. And that's what eventually evolved into this joint agreement with the Italian Federation to raise the level of softball by getting them into a European cup. And that's what allowed us to create that um, team Mediterraneo um, where it was team Italy and Malta combined together going to the European cup. We ended up winning the cup. We came first and then we came second the year after. Um, and it was a great achievement because what that does is it allowed the Maltese to then raise the profile of their sport. Um, it provided more funding opportunities but more so this father was able to build his network of coaches across the European circuit. 
So fast forward to now today, and I retired happily from softball with all that I achieved and all the friendships and, and the families that I got to live with and the teammates who are some of my, you know, most lifelong friends. Um, I wanted to see what it was like to do it again. And, but this time from a winter sport perspective, I have no like, you know, experience. Um, I'm a summer athlete through and through. I live for the sunsets and chasing softball fields around the world and love my softball tan. Um, so when I flipped to the winter side, I thought, how am I going to create winter culture in a summer country that is literally an island? It is the Jamaica of Europe. And the more and more I started, you know, telling people this story and, you know, and I had already kind of sussed out what it was to be a skeleton athlete I started to see if I could do it physically and you know do you know is this something I could see myself doing and the more and more I started to visualize things and put things into practice um, and also when I had connected with a few people in the skeleton community and they said that I had they knew that I had a second passport they're like don't represent you won't have a chance representing Canada. And that was very true. The, the talent pool in Canada is quite thick and there's only three spots available at the top level. And these girls have been training, you know, like they did with me in, or like I had done in softball, you know, six to eight years of their lives from 2010, 2012 has been dedicated to this sport. Um, and so the mom was like, you need to use your Maltese passport and grow the sport. And I thought, well, that's actually such a great idea. It makes sense. It's perfect fit for what I want to achieve. And because I work in the athletes wellness space with game plan, um, you know, a big piece of that understanding of finding balance on and off the field of play and making sure that, you know, we program things for our athletes that, you know, create balance. So I wanted to know what it was like to start a sport, build a culture of it in a completely, you know, crazy way in the sense that it's a country that you know, it's very limited to access to this sort of sport and then to un build programs around it. You know, that's, that's what it's going to be eventually, but I'm starting everything from ground zero. And that's the beauty of this. It's been self-funded in a lot of ways. I, you know, <laughs> emptied my account, um, you know, a few times to make this happen and to try it out. Cause you know, I could have literally said no to this whole thing. And, you know, this whole idea could have gone out the window because I mean, I have to physically see myself potentially do it. And it takes a person to, to do it, to make this opportunity um, happen. Um, and, you know, you, you look at the, the stories of the Jamaican bobsledders. Yeah. Um, it's literally that, but 2.0 in the sense that what's interesting about this story. So there's two, you know, two angles that this story comes from. There's the softball side and like the sport for development piece. Um, but when I was, it all kind of goes back actually to when I was a little girl, my dad and my mom, obviously, you know, always showing their kids about what the Olympics are about. And, you know, we were obviously a heavily summer family. We loved watching the summer Olympics. We would watch the winter Olympics too. Um, and, you know, my mom would always talk about the Olympics and her favorite athletes and like what it means to be an Olympian. And my dad, you know, coming from Malta, didn't have, he had a connection to sport. He would always talk about his sport upbringing and, and things that he played on when he, when he lived in Malta. Um, but his only main connection was, and it's the funniest story ever, but it's very true. Um, he would always tell us, um, my sister and I, you know what girls, your dad almost was an Olympian. And we were like, what, really? And, you know, as a kid, you think this is, this is amazing. My dad would have been an Olympian. And we're like, well, what sport dad? Like, we don't, we don't know what you really played. And he's like, oh, I was going to be a bobsledder. And I was like, yeah, right. Because my dad was very notorious for like pulling our legs and you yeah. know, around. And it was true. Um, the Maltese government during the Calgary 88 games, they were looking to recruit athletes to represent Malta at the 1988 games in Calgary. And because a lot of Maltese people at that time, you know, the government was pretty unsettled during that time. So a lot of people either lived in Australia or, or immigrated to Australia or Canada. And so there was, you know, Maltese communities in all these different countries. And so they kind of, I guess, you know, connected with 
people that they knew who were living abroad, but wanted to consider training. And because my, my nanu, which is grandpa, my nanu was well connected to um, government. He was a civil servant and um, he got a letter in the mail and he went to my uncles and they said, do we go, do you guys want to consider going to the Olympics? And it was a very real thing. Cause I have four uncles and they thought four uncles, perfect. They're, you know, brothers training would be amazing because genetically they're all at the same, you know, mass and height. And, uh, it was an idea that went in one ear and then it just kind of poof disappeared in midair because um, my one uncle ended up getting hit by a drunk driver and was paralyzed for, I, I don't even know if it's years or months, but he's, he's fully, re he's recovered now. I wouldn't say fully, re he's recovered and he's in good health. Um, but in those years, it was, you know, it was something that was not possible. And so when my dad tells that story, that's his one main connection to the Olympic games. And it was the winter Olympics of all things for team Malta. <laughs> so when I started to think about this idea and, and, you know, I wrote the constitution, um, the Maltese Olympic committee was super supportive. They, you know, I, I went to them with this idea. I presented to them, you know, this is what I did in your country for softball you know, if you believe in me, I will make this happen, but I need your support because there was a few things that I needed to be done that I just couldn't do from abroad. Um, you need to be a sport that is recognized within your nation first. And to do that, you need to have a lawyer, you need to have a constitution, you need to have funding, you know, some sort of funding model put in place. And, and then once you have that within your nation and it's established, then you can present to the International Federation all of the work that you've done and why you're looking to be licensed as a nation and, and approved by the committee that brings in new, new countries to the sport. And so a lot of this was definitely, yes, started by me, but I definitely had been very well supported by the Maltese Olympic Committee in terms of making sure that it was an entity in Malta. Um, I have a cousin that coaches, the, who used to coach the netball national team. And she kind of helped me connect with a sport lawyer and then it was going to cost a lot of money and it, a lot of euros. And I was like, Oh, what am I getting myself into? And, and it was funny, you know, as I start working on this project, it was like, you know, this whole thing could completely fold and, you know, be kiboshed and not exist tomorrow. And that could have happened every step of the way. But every time I went back to chipping away at it and, and learning, you know, from the Canadian sports system while working here at the Canadian Olympic Committee, how, how we manage sport, how we, you know, create policies, you know, I kept thinking, okay, how much further can I push this? Like, let's just see where this goes. And so it came to the point where we were approved to push our paperwork to the International Federation, which is the IBSF or the International Bobsleigh uh, Skeleton Federation. And they were approving things and it was, you know, a, a waiting period, COVID had happened. And I think it was like three months. So by May, we got notification that we had been approved. And then I was thinking, oh my goodness. Oh, oh, oh. I like this is real like there this is actually happening and now I have to really start you know putting my vision into practice which is I think even more scarier you can have all these ideas but then when it actually comes to fruition it's like oh my goodness here we go um, oh, by the way I want to interject something here um, for those that are listening this long into the you ought to see Shannon. She is a skeleton herself. She's so built that girl <laughs> could probably go into the lifting competition or the bodybuilding competition. So this is not just a casual athlete that's going to try to go fast. She is built for speed. She's built to train. I'm I'm totally impressed with what's going on in her life. Um, also, I want to talk about funding too. Do you have some place where we can help you? Yeah, it, it's funny with COVID, it really put the brakes on things for me. I I should just do a GoFundMe. I've been very hesitant about doing something um, related to that because of COVID-19. Um, Let's just stop that, is, Shannon, stop that. I know. I, I a just lot of people out there who want to help you, so. I, I appreciate it, Kurt. I, I do, and I should 
I guess with a lot of friends were very curious to know about that. And um, a lot of it, I did as much as I could on my own this season. I was very fortunate that the IBSF provided um, a development um, fund. Um, so I received 5,000, was it five? 3,000 euros, so 5,000 Canadian to support my first season. Now, obviously that doesn't, it, it, it went to plane tickets and hotels and a little bit of my equipment. Um, for this next season, I'm gonna need definitely a lot more. I've, I've wor I'm working out a budget. I definitely wanna be um, very transparent in how I present the plan. Um, qualifying for Beijing is gonna definitely be a challenge. There's uh, monobob, which is something that I've heavily considered as well, um, because the monobob is a new sport for women. And unfortunately, a lot of the driving camps and driving schools were closed because of COVID. So as a new athlete coming into the sport, this was supposed to be my biggest year to really grab onto a lot of fundamentals um, and getting tons of runs in and tons of experience. Um, it's definitely going to be a challenge. Um, you know, it, it's made it even harder with COVID. So in terms of qualifications, I don't know where I stand. And I've considered mono bob because it's a new sport there's a lot more um opportunity mm. to grow um so to you know to piggyback off the funding question um a bobsled i thought bobsleds were going to be quite easy in terms of um access for you know a new small nation is what i'm considered a small nation because we're you know we're under you know we have one athlete two athletes five athletes total mm. And a bobsled cost 25,000 euros. And I thought, this is bananas. That's like a down payment on a house. And my parents would kill me if I spent 25,000 euros on a bobsled. And so I've been trying to work out with the IBSF and, and other athletes in the community. Like, how do I get access? You know, how do I, um, you know, I was doing training camps for skeleton and I was, trying to double up where I could, but I couldn't um, just with timing and, you know, man maintaining my career with the Canadian Olympic Committee. So taking time off is, is, is not easy, um, but they are, they are very supportive of this goal. And I'm very, very fortunate to um, finally, you know, really take this year and this experience of competing in my first North American cup circuit and now really have the groundwork and understanding as to how the sport operates. Um, and now what I need to do to like really prepare myself for this upcoming season. Well, we are really going to be behind you and what you do here. We want you to keep us focused um, on what you're doing. Put things out there. There's going to be, I'm going to tag you in this or on your Facebook page. So Thank you. people can know what's going on, but I want you to tag us back. Um, I can get some word out to um, get you some, get a, get you a hand, which will be helpful. Anyhow, for those that are listening, this girl is a world-class girl. Yes, sir. Yes, she's a world-class athlete, but um, she's built more. Her heart and her mind is so good that if you ever want to emulate someone or have your girls emulate someone, this is a girl that could be that girl. That's how much I think of her. So, Shannon, thank you so much. I'm sorry to steal all this time, but um, you're um, you're absolutely world class, and it's a privilege to be able to know you. I'm going to follow you. I'm going to support you too. So know that. Thank, thank you so much, Kurt. It's it's been an honor to catch up with you and to share this story. I I do need to story tell more. I think COVID's. I and I hate to use COVID as an excuse, but I've been very cognizant of you know the climate of things and and. Um, here in Canada, it's, it's, you know, we're pretty restricted right now with the, the way things are working out. And um, so- a few, few hours to get groceries. Yeah, I have only have a few more hours to get groceries before my curfew. <laughs> right? They will arrest you. Yeah, I better get going. But yeah, it's just, yeah, I think it's it's a, a great story to share and I should put it out there more. And I will be through my photography and, and you know, storytelling that I will be doing. And I, I do hope the summer kind of changes the vibe here in Canada. Um, but it's I was very coming, cognizant. It's coming, it's coming. It's coming. But it's Shannon, all... I'm going to let you go here. So um, you've got to go to work too. And I've got some other things. Uh, Zoom is actually, but actually more softball and oriented. But I love this. This is pretty dang cool. So thank Amazing. you. Tell your parents hello for me. I will. I will. They'd be happy to hear from you. And I hope to connect again. Yeah, we will. I can promise. Wonderful. You. Thanks, Thanks Kurt. Take care. Okay. Now we're done. 
There we go. Oh my gosh. <laughs>